Okay, so welcome to our introduction, uh, introduction to IoT class. Uh, remember, this is just the very first part of our two-part introduction to IoT and then connecting things class this summer. And then for free, you're getting IoT security, so uh, bonus material. Um, you will notice, one thing I will tell you, and you will notice there's a lot of overlap between introduction to IoT and connecting things. Um, it would be possible and it will be possible when you start teaching this to skip some things in connecting things because of the fact you've already covered them in intro to IoT. Or you could just do connecting things and not do intro to IoT. I like to do both um, just because that way students can get to do things twice sometimes too. Um, by the way, I've been in meetings all day, so my eyes are about to fall out of my head. Um, I had to present to our Rotary Club today and then we had an hour and a half meeting on some things in the academy. It be very interesting, let's just put it that way. Um, so we'll go from there, but um, flow charts. One of the things about uh, programming, when we talk about in this entire chapter is on everything becomes programmable. And uh, to give you an idea of how much the Cisco Academy is pushing programmability, um, I've been in a Python class. I'm still not good at it because I didn't have time to do it because it was during the COVID-19, but I'm doing the programming essentials in Python. I've gone through it a couple times. I'm still working on that. Uh, we're now doing the network programmability class, which is funny that I'm actually taking that class after having taught those labs at NCCIA, but uh, go figure. Um, but, and then uh, DevNet limited availability is coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, and that's only for instructor trainers right now. But, so they are really pushing um, the, the programmability and rightfully so, because I mean, when you look at what's going on and, and the job requisitions out there, almost all of it's looking for some type of programmability. Um, one of the first things I talk in this particular section is on a flow chart. You, all of you, how, any of you teach programming now? Susan, Derek? Yeah, I do. Somebody just, uh, yeah, it's Derek. I don't, I, right. okay. I don't teach any programming as well. What are you programming, Derek? Oh, um, we do, uh, Python and Java and, uh, you know, several different languages. Okay. Well then this, a lot of this is probably going to be, you know, well, we'll review for you. Um, but for students starting out, this is a good way to kind of look at what programming is. And programming is really just flow charts and figuring out how that and, and mathematical equations um, figure out how to make things work in a logical fashion. So they talk about a flow chart, you know, start, read the door sensor. Is the door open? The answer is no, you do a counter delay. If the answer is yes, there's another counter. All the way down to when will the alarm be sounded? Um, great example of this is my fire suppression system at Stanley Community College in my data center. I think I mentioned to y'all that we- There was some breakup. Do what? I got this. I'm gonna turn my video off, folks. That may help me. I'll stop my video. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm at home. I, I had left my can of kits here. I was actually going to run class from school, but I left my can of kits here. Um, so I had to come home and do this. But um, so a good example of this flow chart is that fire suppression system. Basically, from the time that the fire suppression system sees smoke, um, you've got a 10 second delay to where it will go into a 30, actually it's a 10 second delay. It goes into a 30 second countdown. So if it still smells smoke or sees smoke in that, uh, it will then dump after 30 seconds the entire fire suppression system. Um, the good news is, and that's not really shown in here, but the way my, the fire suppression system is written is that if it sees enough smoke, so there's actually a percentage, um, the sensors can see the percentage. If it sees it high enough, the first 10 second countdown will be skipped immediately. So to jump from basically no alarm to we're gonna dump in 30 seconds. Uh, almost instantaneously. And that's actually what happened to us uh, a couple weeks ago when we dumped our fire suppression system. Um, so flow charts, getting people to think of things logically. Obviously this is uh, replacing a light bulb, but anytime we can get our students thinking logically, it's a good thing. I like to use flow charts uh, when we look at how do we troubleshoot things. Um, you know, and that's something that was taught in the curriculum for years and years. If you've been in the Cisco Academy for a long time, uh, you know, there used to be an entire network troubleshooting chapter, uh, and they taught network troubleshooting. 
So here's a program to verify leap years in Python. So you can go through here uh, and do this. Uh, funny thing I just found out today while playing around in uh, one of the uh, labs, there was a, a, an error in one of the programs. Not really an error, but it was a, a, a weirdness, shall we say, um, that, that I'll show you in just a minute. Um, but, and I'll also show you what I've done to kind of um, look at ways we can roll out the virtualized server that's used in this class in NetLabs. So variables, so local variables written within scope of the program or feature and the variables that are um, in the scope of the program's execution, they can be retrieved. This is really getting into how do we set um, variables for the programming language so that you can define X, Y, and Z, whatever it happens to be. Let me go ahead and jump over. In fact, one of the labs in this section, one of the first things they have you do in this lab is set up this virtualized environment. Um, I will go ahead and tell you, you can download this, this virtual machine. I have been able to convert it to where it will run inside a VMware workstation, uh, which is really cool. So um, you can download it and boot it up. You'll get an error message saying that it doesn't want to boot up. Um, but basically what I've done is set this up and we'll be setting it up in a NetLabs um, virtual machine. So in other words, you won't have VirtualBox on the way I'm gonna set it up. I'm just gonna skip all this part and I'm gonna deploy it into a single, um, single PC pod inside of NetLabs. Uh, that way nothing has to be installed on your local computers, nothing has to be installed um, by you. The other thing I'm trying to do and, and working hard to do is to get this placed into our portal project so that you'll be able to go to the portal and simply say, I want to be able to access this particular pod and you would basically show up and you get this login screen, um, which I think is going to be doable. Uh, we've got to check it to make sure that the machine does not have any, um, everybody knows there's different levels of open source, right? I mean, um, some things, yes, quote, it's open source. Yes, you can put it out there. Um, but at the same time, you have to be really careful because some companies <laughs> Oracle, uh, are bad to say, yeah, it's open source and then suddenly come back and say, oh no, you're going to owe us $10 billion because of blah, blah, blah. Um, so we've got to pick through this particular VM with a fine tooth comb. I don't think, uh, let me check here. Oops, wrong one. I don't think I've downloaded it here locally. I'm sorry, folks. Nope, not yet. I do have Cisco Modeling Labs 2.0, if you want to look at that sometime. Um, but um, I'll get this and show it to you. I'll have it in a pod for the class, uh, hopefully next week. That's my goal anyway. Uh, but you're going in here and it's just basic Linux commands uh, to, to have you show that. So that's the very first lab. But then the next lab that's available is basic Python programming. And it just has you go into that same VM um, the VM's already got Python 3 installed on it, so you just, it just takes you through there and you load Python. Has you do some basic calculations at the, the Python interpreter interface. Okay, so just basic things here, no big deal there. Um, you open up idle. The only thing that I have not been able to figure out how to do is in VMware work, Workstation pass through a, an F5 to make it run the, the program multiple times. Um, we'll figure that out. I think it'll work when I get it into a, a pod. Uh, but on my local machine, it wasn't working. What oh, we got here somewhere? Yes, yes, Rod, that, yeah, definitely. That's organizational level, not individual use, yeah. Um, you know, the problem would be if you put it in the, um, again, it comes down to, and, and if you're an educational institution, you'd probably be fine too. Uh, the problem is when you start putting it into the portal, uh, the portal could be, um, you know, since the portal is being run by, NDG and us and, and other entities, uh, we could get in trouble. So we have to be really careful about anything in the portal. That's also why it'd be very hard for us to ever put things in the portal that has Microsoft in it. Um, Cause you have to pay that spa fee. Um, there's a fee to pay for each, uh, each time you allow somebody to access a Microsoft operating system on your servers. You have to actually pay per CPU, uh, which is kind of nuts. But here's the one I wanted to show you this uh, doo -doo -doo, simple game with Python. Um, if you write the program, and all it is is a little game that asks you 
uh, here it is. It says, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay. It says enter an integer between zero and 1024. Uh, and then obviously you've got uh, two variables or a and, a and B being set as the values of zero and 1024. X is an integer. And then if you put in zero, it tells you your number zero. If you put in 1024, it tells you it's 1024. If you put any number in between it, it's gonna divide it, figure out what the number is, and then put it back out. Um, the problem you have is this break right here. Um, you really need to put it in a different spot. I believe if I'm not mistaken, I put it at the very end because otherwise, if you put zero, it doesn't break out. And if you put 1024, it doesn't break out. So you get, you know, if you put in X equals zero, you get just, it, it gives you your number zero. Thank you for playing, but it doesn't break out of the program. Um, so I moved that down to the end and, and everything was hunky dory. Um, not a major problem, but see what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to put the number in, it's supposed to break it out, and then you can restart it by hitting F5. Um, those of you who are programming experts, tell me if I'm crazy, uh, but that's what fixed it for me. So. Okay. So in this particular section, let me move on down here. Um, Again, looking at our flow charts, looking at basic Python variables, basic program structures. Uh, this is definitely a design for an introductory course, if then, for loops, while loops, and it talks about it. Prints counter n, where n is the, the value of the counter variable i 100 times, so, and then while loops. So while it's less than 10, continue to do it. So just trying to get students introduced to the basics of programming. Uh, let's see here. Again, programming terms, you can pull through. I had a very difficult, um, very difficult survey to answer this week. The survey asked me, uh, for badging purposes, how much time was spent in each one of the uh, activities inside of like the CCNA curriculum. So for instance, how much time was spent in, on activities? How much time was spent on exams, on quizzes? Um, and, you know, the maximum was 90 minutes. So for some of these things, I was like, well, in one curriculum, you know, we definitely spend more than 90 minutes on, on labs and on packet tracers. So those were easy. But then I tried to have to think about how much time do we spend on activities and, um, oh, God, what's it called? Not the, not the packet tracers, but the uh, syntax checkers, how much time spent in syntax checkers. Um, so that's one of the, looking at these and thinking about that. That was a very difficult thing for me to do. So we have uh, Blockly here, which is inside of our work that we have as our workspace. And Blockly is just a visual, um, visual programming language. Uh, it is on uh, all types of different Linux distributions. Uh, it's on the PyTops, if you've ever had a PyTop. In fact, I'm sending some of those out this week because uh, I'm working with the North Carolina DPI to do some things there. Um, but it's, it's basically just allows students to drag and drop. Um, what's another, what's Scratch? I think the other one, another very common one is Scratch, um, but just Scratch and Blockly are similar, very similar. So here we are looking at Blockly games. You can actually make games, so you can try it by going there, um, which is kind of cool. Especially, one of the things I want you to think about using this class for especially, imagine using this class for your summer camps for kids that are in, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, um, that these materials may be something good for them. And then the connecting things class would be more for, for the others, for your actual ones. Now, here's a packet tracer where we're using Blockly to blink an LED. I'm not gonna show you that because that's pretty easy. Um, I'm not really gonna, we talked about Python. This gets into what Python is. Um, you know, there's a learning curve on it. Uh, Blockly, a lot of times you can use Python Blockly to create Python code, which it will do for you. And here's the interpreter. And by the way, if you have Linux, more than likely you've got both Python 2 and Python 3 installed. Um, so you can go in and look and see what's available. Um, you also usually have the idle pre-installed if you don't. Um, so there's an if-then block on that one. 
So what I want to do, and this gets in the variables and statements. So uh, looking at the interpreter and what the interpreter will do, um, how it will output certain things. Tax equals this, price equals this, price times tax will give you, obviously that's that, price plus, and it will show you all that. So getting into how uh, Python displays items. So just basic programs, nothing major. Um, now what I want to do, let's see. Now one thing I will tell you, you can spend a lot of time looking at lists. Trust me, if you've been in the programming essentials in Python, there's all types of uh, items about lists and tuples um, and sets. The, this class is not going to make you an expert on these. Um, it really just, gives you a basic understanding of them, and then has you use some of these in the labs. So we're gonna go through here, here's Python dictionary with four elements. Okay, here's your list, or set, excuse me. So unordered collection of, of unique elements, lists are sequenced, changeable objects. List one is car, train, 47, 2016. And then you can use those, the information in the list as part of your programming. Uh, we've already talked about these. Let's get here. Okay, so we've set that up. Let's do, let's actually go on in and look at, there's an entire section on prototyping. Um, I'll give you a great example of a prototyping situation I had. I had somebody send me the, a part that they were trying to build for a coupler for one of the local companies to be able to, to put around a, um, a shaft and they built it. I printed it out on our 3D printers, printed two of them, and then they just cleaned it up and made sure it would fit before they had it CNC. Um, and then once it was, they could see that printed out in PLA, it would work, you know, the tolerances were correct, everything was okay. We basically prototyped it in PLA and then they, they had it made in metal. So. Um, you know, we try to make, and they talk about being prototyped, it's fully functional, but not fault proof. Um, it does work. You know, they, they actually put screws in it to make sure it would, uh, or actually bolts to make sure it would fit, uh, with the example that I gave you, but it's not a, um, complete version. A lot of times too, you prototype, it doesn't work and you try again. I like this picture. I think it's pretty neat. Um, not real sure what, what's going on, but. Uh, just cutting off the extra wire, I hope. So Legos are the ultimate prototype. Uh, now, folks, I have to tell you, I absolutely love Mindstorms. You know that the the this stuff is is just like awesome. And so um, there's all kind of cool stuff, and I just flat love Legos. Period. Um, so Legos are super cool. Um, but this is a good way if you ever want to get into to doing some 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 things that aren't crazy expensive. I mean, that's expensive, but it's not crazy expensive. So you can build your own robots and things. So that's really neat. Um, have any of you got a um, a maker space at your school? Any of you build a maker space? We have talked about it. Um, we have not done it yet, but we have talked about it. Um, so we got somebody's chatting here. Uh, no, but our area libraries have. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's one thing that we're, we're ta we've talked about doing in one of our rooms in our building because we do have a room that we considered doing it in, and then they moved in the uh, success coach in there. So we no longer have a makerspace room. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Raspberry Pi. And we are going to try, and I'm not gonna promise you it's gonna work, but I've got over here on the floor, and hold on just a second. Oh, hey, you're not gonna be able to see it anyway. But over there on the floor is my Raspberry Pi hooked up, wired to my network, by the way. I did wire it to my network. Um, now, one of the things I wanna do for you is, I'm gonna turn my video back on. Um, I want to warn you that there is, when you start setting this up, you'll notice that there's a, you put the PL app on your PC 
and then you run through with your canna kit. Now in your canna kit, um, let me go ahead and I will stop the video here. In your canna kit, you'll have your SD card. You'll have, every canna kit comes with an SD card reader. Okay. And you will go in and load on that SD card the special version of Raspberry Pi for this class. Okay. Now, one thing they don't tell you, and if you don't watch the video, okay, so there's a video uh, in how to set up this particular lab, and I think it's, no, it's not there. Um, there is a video. I have to find it, but I also have one on my, if you look on my, uh, on my YouTube page, I have a video on setting this up, and I'll actually send out to the class after class today. But during the setup, you will get an error message about uh, the file system or something when you're, when you're loading it on the, on the card. You can just ignore that message. I didn't watch the video. And by the way, the video is in the connecting things class. But I didn't watch the video, so I spent two days trying to troubleshoot that message just to find out it, had, it wasn't really an error message. It wasn't really something you need to worry about. Um, so be aware of what you do is you can download um, you, you download the pill app for your operating system. Um, you will set up a new device and you got to download the image for it. And you'll notice it's about a 900 meg image. And if I'm not mistaken, where's the image at? Yep, right there's the image, the app image. So right there. And you will use the pill app launcher app. I'm going to load it on my machine here. I don't think I have it yet. Turn off my video so we can. I'm going to create a desktop shortcut. I'm going to allow that access because it needs to go out and find the device. But here's where you will actually uh, put your SD card reader in. You'll take the image that you download from here and point it to here. Give your device a name and a password. Now, if you were setting up um, if everybody wants to, I can set up another one with Wi-Fi if you want to try it. I just have to download this image. If y'all want to give it a shot, I should be able to see, if I do this though, hopefully I will actually see my device over there shortly. It's supposed to find it via layer two uh, MDNS broadcast, it's supposed to find it over there. If that doesn't work, I can go do some snooping and find it with my my local router. Or we can just set up a new device. Okay, let me go. See if I can get this thing. Hold on one second. How many of you are ready to set yours up today? Because we can walk through it. I may stop the, the recording, but we'll walk through it together if you want to. Let's download the app. Oh Lord, it's 1.3 gigs. That can't be right. Yeah, it is. Let me go back to my Cisco app. It is not finding my device. Must not be letting go of that IP address it picked up back at work. So let's go over here and make a change. When in doubt, oh, back up and pump. Oh, you know what? I'm an idiot. I'll be right back, folks. I'm over here messing with a switch. Give me a second. Your instructor is an idiot. I had plugged the stupid thing into the printer. I wonder if I couldn't find the couldn't find it. Let's give it a second. I'm gonna have to reboot it. Let's see what it does. I'll have to reboot it.
it's kind of hard to see it when it's connected to your, your printer instead of your network. Layer one issue, folks, layer one issue. Okay, that's fine, Rod. That's no problem. I'm about the same way. I'm downloading it here. I'm gonna have to stop that because it's gonna kill kill all my bandwidth. But I'll get it downloaded myself. Um, as soon as this gets up and running, I should actually be able to find the device because what you do is once you can once you write to the SD card. Okay, so you go through. You tell it where your SD card is. You tell it the PL app what it is. Give it a device name, give it a Wi-Fi pass, Wi-Fi. If you're going to use Wi-Fi, I'm using wired because um, it's just easier for me. Um, but you can go in here and it will actually write to that image. It'll write the entire image to it. And you'll eventually get a file called chestnut.txt, which is um, your configuration settings to your SD card. And then... Uh, you also can just do it if you want to, and if you're a Linux guru, you can just do it yourself. Stick in the card, and once it boots up, you should be able to just go to available devices, and as long as it's on the same layer two network as you, it should show up. So that's kind of the neat thing about it, and of course it's not working right this second. I should have been trying to manually add the name of it. I don't know the name of it. But here's something that's important to note. Inside the box is a an HDMI cable. So I'm just gonna do this. I'm just gonna update it. This is easy. All right, so. Let me get a couple things here, folks. First off, you'll notice that the, it is kind of neat, the, uh, the fact that, turn my camera on, it comes with a little box to put it in. So I'm gonna pop this box open and I'm going to take out the actually I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna pull the card out. So I got the card out. And it's hard to see there. I'm gonna put it into my little SD card reader. Like so. Stick it on to my USB. Stick it into my USB drive here. And hopefully. It will show, yep, I'll get a new drive, and there it is. So let's see if we can't update. We're going to update config only. Let's go in here and pick E, is that correct? Yep. Oh. Uh, Nope, can't do that. It's going to put my Wi-Fi password on the internet. Hold on just a minute. Actually, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Actually, hold on just a second. I got this. Let me show you what I did to give you an idea. Since I, I'm not going to redo 
I'm not going to redo the uh, the update, but what I did was I went in. I meant to stop my video. I pulled up the card itself. I went down and found the chestnut.txt. And so the device name is KFC IoT, which that's my initials. So I'm going to copy that and I'm actually going to put that in the PL app just instead of redoing it. So I'm going to put that in. And then I'm going to close this out. And I'm going to put it back into my device and fire it back up. And I should be able to get to it now. So let's go see. Phone's blowing up. Uh, got that in there. So let me go put this back on the network. Give me one second. tell you folks that part of these classes are definitely playing with stuff trying to get it to work uh, you know when they say prototyping uh, sometimes this is open source software so on occasion it just decides that it's going to do its own thing um, not often but it does happen so let me get the peel out There we go. So let me share. So you see now that you can actually see the device, KFC IoT. Um, I connect to it and it brings up the web browser. And this is a password that you set during your during the installation. And at this point, you've got of course materials. You've got the ability to do the, the notebooks. You've got the running apps. If there's a terminal, you can actually start a terminal if you want to. Um, let's go down to our actual materials here. So we've set it up. We connect to it. At this point, once we're able to connect to it, we should be able to do the first lab, which is an optional notebook. So when we go in here, you look at the fact that we've got uh, accessing the different labs on the on the particular pill app or on the particular Raspberry Pi. So we've installed it. We connect to it. Once we're inside of it, we've got access to all the different things here. So we can go to like tutorials. So if I go in here and I go, I'm already in it up here. Where'd it go? Okay. I can go to files. I can go to course materials, um, tutorials and demos, Blockly. And then here's an actual Blockly. I, I clicked on the one that was for uh, Arduino Formata, but I could just have easily, there's a, uh, go back, the Python. So here's different Python plot graphs using Matplotlib. So all of these are actually labs inside of, keep clicking the wrong thing, inside of the curriculum. So here it is. Uh, real-time plot and Blockly. So you can go into Blockly, real-time plot. You can put in your things and see the different plot. So let's go back over to it. Let's go back to my... Blockly, real-time graph plot, there it is. So now you can see we've got uh, in Blockly, we can go in here and create a random integer from one to one. And so we can do one to 100. And then we can run it. I'm going to click run. And we get a line chart. And we can see what it's doing for how long it's running. 
So we get a random number and we can see here repeat 10 times. And so we see that as we change this in Blockly, so if I change this to 100 times, okay, and I run it, you'll see that now it gives me the Python code and it displays it for me down here. So what we basically have done is now we put a Raspberry Pi that has access to the tutorials and materials for the class out on our network that students can connect to in real time. Now, one of my questions that I've been thinking seriously about, and I want your opinion on it, what do you think about trying to take several of these and put them into an environment where they're sitting in a NetLabs pod, and then you could just connect to them with a PC inside of the NetLabs pod. And so make a, a PL app or a Raspberry Pi. Now the negative would be um, you can't really, I need somebody's help that really knows Raspberry Pi, but I don't think you can virtual, I wouldn't be able to virtualize this version of Raspberry Pi, but we could definitely put a real machine in there and have it uh, going out to it, which is which I think would be kind of cool. Opinions on that? I'll, I'll just, if you can hear me okay. Yeah, I got here. you. All right. Um, I think from, uh, for the student, I think having at least having that option available for students that can't afford to go out and buy the can of kits, um, because I know they're not much, but there are students that, that can't afford that. But that'd be yeah. a nice, at least a nice option, unless you have some sort of tuition-based thing where there's kits that can go out to students that have um, some financial aid. Now, and that would be another option is the school provides them free of charge it's under certain circumstances. We, but anyway, that's just my, my two cents on. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think one thing you could do, especially if you look at the fact that maybe this kit that we have can be used for multiple classes. Um, if you can figure out a way to use it for multiple classes and then make it the book fee. You know, if this is a required thing that you, you have them get, and unfortunately you have to put in the bookstore, which means they're gonna mark it up 30 to 40%. Um, but if you could do that, then their financial aid can pay for it. But I like, I'm like you, I like, the, I like the ability to have it out there just in case. Yeah, booger tech fee. Um, I think you could easily do it as a tech fee for some classes, but you know, hundred dollars it had to be more of a book fee. Um, they, could they check it out? I mean, oh, that's getting off subject of what your question is. But uh, does uh, Stanley check out any equipment? Because I know, like our college checked out a few laptops that they were able. It was like college laptops, um, very you know, very simple you know not a lot of, enough to do what you need to do in the, your classes right. and they checked them out because and it was because of covid but you know that i think that's going to stick around after all of this yeah we we have not um we have actually checked out uh chromebooks um at this point we started checking out chromebooks um but yeah i mean you could i, I would wonder how my worry would be like the um your LEDs and stuff going missing out of these boxes. That'd be my only worry. Um, you could, you could buy those as consumables though. I mean, like, true. it's kind of like sending out a kit to, uh, I mean, you would, probably wouldn't do this, but if you're teaching cabling, you're not going to get your ends back. I mean, those are something that you just have a line item in your budget that, you know, we restock these kits and I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, so Susan made a good point. She said the LEDs walk away even when you use them in class. That's true. That's very true. Um, and they're easy to get the five finger discount on. So people, people put the discount on them. But hey, you know, you can take the LED and stick it on a, on a 2032 battery and make it light up. I mean, you got to take it home. Got to show everybody that you make the LED light up. Um, I do like the fact that, like I said, I loaded this particular, um, I'm gonna shut all these down because I run. I actually uh, loaded this particular um, Raspberry Pi at work. But as long as I know the name, I'm able to connect to it through the PL app, which is kind of neat because it does see it, it. And I'm using the uh, the other. So by going in and finding out the name, um, 
I can just take it. So what you could do, I guess, if you were going to lease them out or, or lend them out, is make sure that each box had its name on it. So if it was IoT, uh, if the PL app name was IoT 12, but then they're going to have to have internet at home to be able to get to it, um, or at least a network at home. Um, so I do like the idea of figuring out a way to put some of these into a pod. Um, any of you familiar with or have you worked with the Raspberry Pi, uh, virtualized Raspberry Pi? Because you would think that since we've got the image, this PL app, we could make it work. We could actually set it up and make one work. So no, okay, I hadn't either. Um, well, I take it back. We've loaded it. We've loaded it in one. Um, in one, but not in the other. So I don't know why I hit share there. My screen share went. Okay, that's something we could look into. I mean, we could look into to seeing if we could do that. Um, uh, let's see, Raspberry Pi. Virtualization, virtual machine. I'll play around in it. No, that's not what we're talking about. Raspberry and Light. We're talking about using Raspberry Pi as a virtual machine. No, that's not what I'm looking for. But I don't think there's an easy way to do it. I know there's been some some work on it, but not a great deal. Um, the neat thing is, once you set up though this pill app, you can go through uh, multiple different, all the labs basically. Oh, here it is, there's a video, I'm a doofus. Um, let me see if I can show you that particular. This is the lab image file. We're gonna download this from that, yeah, from so. netacad.com. Sure, it's a tool that's gonna allow us, it's a very quick install, and that's for SD card reader. There's many different versions to find that USB card. I can just so I can make it. And put the open. No. So, we well, in here, it basically says, ignore this. And it's kind of crazy. You're like, uh, I spent three days trying to fix this. Now, and install. We don't have the current USB wireless name. It actually did. Sorry, I'm jumping around, y'all, but I'm trying to find it for you. Your network. There are available to the file explorer. Uh, just watch this whole thing. It's important that you watch it because, like I said, it's not in the lab itself. And so, when you go to do this with your Canna kit, watch the video, then do it. Um, and you can see you're giving a name. And if you have Wi Fi now, if you do have Wi Fi, I have not tested the Wi Fi uh, setup. Um, that's something I guess I can, I can do with this next kit. Um, but one of the things I'd like for you to try to do if you've got a Raspberry Pi, um, if, you, if you've got the kit go ahead and set it up at home for next week if you don't have a raspberry pi kit but you have a raspberry pi we can always try it in fact i'm going to try it on a raspberry pi that i have that's not in a can of kit uh before next week and i'll let you know how that works should work fine i uh, like so long as you got a big enough sd card and you got a uh, raspberry pi 3 you should be good to go which i've got another raspberry pi here that i have no idea what i bought for but this may not, this is not even a three, this is a two. That probably won't work. Nope. Yeah, that's talking about old school. Good gracious me. That thing's terrible. Yeah. You want to see some old school? Check this out. Look at that SD card. That's insane. So, pretty sure this is a Raspberry. Previous edition Raspberry Pi. So that won't work. It's, I tell you what, getting old is terrible because you can't see the boards. But I'll, I'll try it on my other one to see if we can't. But if you've got a Raspberry Pi that's a Raspberry Pi 3, you should be able to load the, the image on it and make it work. All right, so let's go on through here and see what else chapter two we can play with. Um, you've got blinking lamp. Now this one's cool because this takes the Raspberry Pi that's in our prototyping lab and you connect the breadboard to it. And then you push out the lab. 
So if we all get our Raspberry Pis up and connected to our networks by next week, we'll run through this lab together next week. And I'll have to put my camera down and just show you that as I'm doing it in front of you, but uh, we'll run through this lab together if uh, everybody's got theirs up and going next week. Um, that way we can, can play with it. And you see here we're using Blockly to just throw, put in what the things will actually do. Um, and that's a lot harder than what you think trying to get it to blink SOS. For me it was anyway, because I'm not the sharpest tack in the tool shed. And now here's our, our Arduino labs. Our Arduino labs are going to be what we use our other kits for. So if you've got your other kit in, we'll, we'll use it to start playing with the Arduino labs. And we can do that again next week too. So um, go ahead and get your, your Raspberry Pi set up. And do if you can, go ahead and do the labs up to the blinking LED and do it too if you want to. But try to get those labs done. Um, I know they're listed as optional labs. But as much as possible, I'd like for us to try to do them um, because that's really the hands-on stuff that I think makes it fun uh, for this particular class. You'll notice if I go back to our class, um, I was asked about, my wife's trying to call. Um, I'm gonna ignore her. Y'all don't tell her. I know this is being video record, recorded, but don't tell her I'm ignoring her. Um, but if you look under the connecting things class and look at the labs, they, the labs are shared between the two. So you're actually doing work for both of your classes once you get these set up. So let's go here. Actually, I'm going to go down here. But you'll see how we're getting into using LED board, peel app, setting up peel app, notebook. And this is the exact same thing. Now this is using the peel app to get to running basic Linux commands. So we actually connect to the peel app and get to a terminal, which we can do by going here, going back to leave there, new terminal. And so now we get a terminal. And so you can, you can actually have a, you can play with the, the, Linux portion using that same Raspberry Pi with the pill out, which is very cool. So that's one of the reasons I want you to get it set up so that you can use it uh, for the classes and connecting things and in the, the class we're in now. So you see we have all kinds of things. And every one of these, every one of these uses, you connect to the pill app and then you do your, your labs, okay? So it's kind of important that you, that you have the can of kit. Um, or at least a Raspberry Pi that will work with the Canon kit. Any questions? Any questions about, and I know I blew through chapter two, um, but any, any questions on chapter two? Any questions about how you set this up? Um, it's not that difficult. I think the biggest thing is just downloading. If you're like me, the biggest problem is downloading the, uh, downloading the, the, the actual software because it's, too big for my internet. Uh, on on the, the Python section, I know, and I've had a lot of people work, and I come from a, no, I'm not, I took like PHP back in like 2000. So I'm like really, really not a programmer. Um, so I got concepts, but that's about it. So besides Python, is there other languages that you'd recommend that is kind of, you know, looking forward? Um, as far as I know, Python, everybody recommends to learn that. Yeah. But what other ones would be of use? I would say, um, and I'm going to show my ignorance here. Somebody can help me out, but anything in PowerShell, um, PowerShell scripting to me, um, is, is big. Um, in fact, I actually thought about trying to create a PowerShell class and, and offering a PowerShell class because I thought people in, in it would take it. Um, Python's the big one. Uh, what's the, let me think, what's that other one? I was just, Help me out, folks. I know Python and... I, I, there's one called R that I've heard is good uh, to learn. I don't know much about it, but my, I, wife's a, my wife's a programmer, but she knows she's too far beyond to be right. helpful to a beginner. She's in C, C++. I mean, she's in C, C Sharp. And yeah. She's in so, the high-level stuff. Yeah. Really high-level stuff. Um, 
I think for us and for what we do, our better bet is to stay around Python scripts and learn how to do scripting. Um, and that's why I say PowerShell and PowerShell into Python scripts. Um, you know, a lot of people would say Java. Um, I don't know. I think JavaScript's kind of, uh, I think Java's lost a lot of its luster. Uh, Y'all tell me if I'm lying through my teeth, but I rarely see much about Java anymore. Um, but I see a lot about Python, so. Um, I think the JavaScript's going to stick. From what I understand, JavaScript's going to stick around for a while, but the yeah. like Java itself is, yeah. yeah not. I think There's JavaScript a lot of, would not be a bad thing, but. There's a lot of embedded stuff out there that's still in use is the problem with Java. It is, so. yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, so I think that's, I think that is uh, one of the reasons why Java, JavaScript is still not a bad thing. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I am not a programmer either. Um, as y'all can obviously see, uh, actually I am a programmer, but I program in the Cisco iOS. Um, you know, I consider that almost a programming language when you think about, if you really think about it, there's a lot to that. Um, there's a programming language, but if you look at how the programmability features that are being written in the Cisco devices are almost all using Python or some type of Python-esque JavaScript or XML, learning XML format, obviously always good. Um, but I think from a scripting standpoint, Java, or not Java, excuse me, Python is the way to go. So. Let me, anybody else have anything uh, to add or questions? I did not, like I said, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to. I do like the fact that we can, like I said, you can connect to it. Even if, if you, hear something to remember. If you set it up at home, at work, don't be like Kelly. Don't be Kelly. Um, remember the name you gave it because whatever name you give it, even if you set it up at work, if you bring it home and plug it into your network, if you add that device name in, you won't have to set it up again. You, and you won't have to take the card out like I did. Uh, to figure out what you you named it, you'll be able to just go in and, and grab it and, and and connect to it. So, and all it's doing is running a little web web app, you know, on on the PL app. So, you'll notice too, this is used in the big data analytics class, the hackathon, and the IoT security. So, there's all kind of notebooks that you can extract. So, there's you extract your own notebooks there, but it's all everything is available as we go through. For the, for the different courses when we get there. All right. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to...